really excited today for our uh, next Transcend seminar speaker. Uh, today we have Dr. Marisol Perez, who's an associate professor here in our Department of Psychology. Um, her research emphasizes both theoretical and applied uh, studies in the area of eating psychopathology and obesity, often focus on the question of population. So today she's going to talk to us about disordered eating among ethnic minorities. I can't say we have been anticipating this, but we've tried to get her last year, but the only reason we got her this year is because she's on sabbatical and she's not teaching. So we're just really thrilled with that. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I was excited um, to come talk to you because we, this is like data that's hot off the press. And for, for at least the set for researchers, hot off the press data is like having a present that you want to unwrap, right? And so this is a great opportunity to allow us to really start to delve into some of the data that we just collected. And so, yeah, I, um, I do different lines of work, childhood um, obesity, health disparities, eating disorders. Um, connected through that is, um, is a focus on ethnic minority populations. And in this line of work, um, or this study is part of a line of work really documenting the clinical presentation of ethnic minorities um, with eating disorders and also just looking at our current models in the field, how well do they represent um, ethnic minorities. And so that's some of what this is about. Okay, so eating disorders are, a, oh, let me just say, if you have any questions, just stop me as we go along. You don't have to wait till the end, okay? Um, so eating disorders are a serious public health um, issue and they're associated with a number of physical and mental health conditions. Um, and in addition, hey, come on. No, um, sub, in presenter mode. Do you need, oh, sorry. Do you want to pause or just... I can keep going. Okay, okay. keep going. Okay. Keep going. Okay. In addition, not only at clinical level, so there's that when I say clinical levels, I mean people who meet diagnostic thresholds for an eating disorder. Some clinical levels also show impairment in both physical and mental health, not necessarily to the same degree as clinical levels, although there are some research studies that find that at times we can't distinguish in terms of comorbidity or impairment those that are at subclinical level versus those that are at clinically diagnostic level. So there is some research that at some constellation of our symptoms at the subclinical level are actually as severe as those that meet diagnostic threshold. Thank you. Um, so when I'm talking today about eating disorders, I'm actually referring to three groups. Um, I'm referring to anorexia nervosa and individuals who meet criteria for anorexia nervosa according to the DSM-5. They really are characterized by a, um, a distorted body image. Um, that distorted body image, there's also a really heavy concentration on shape and weight evaluate, um, evaluation um, where it's tied to their identity, their self-esteem. There's also a fear of fat. But new to the DSM-5, it's a fear of fat or a refusal to maintain body weight, which is an important distinction for ethnic minority groups because ethnic minority groups, according to the literature, really are less likely to show a fear of fat or a fear of weight gain, but, but still show a, re, a refusal to maintain um, the normal body weight for that individual. Bulimia nervosa is characterized by binge eating and binge eating, how much of this do you guys already know? Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. That's what I need. Um, so binge eating is characterized by eating a large amount of food. Now you're wondering, you may wonder, well, what's a large amount of food? We say as clinicians, unambiguously large for that individual. And what that means is if you normally, if whatever you would normally eat in one meal, um, certainly if you eat three times that in a short, discrete period of time, um, and definitely two times what you would eat. But you know, now we get into a little bit more gray area where there's more subjectivity and is that sufficiently large or not? The key thing about the binge eating episode is that it's actually coupled with loss of control over eating. The individuals report that they actually lose control in the ability to stop eating. Often either somebody else stops them or they run out of food. And the loss of control over eating is really what's important in distinguishing because overeating is a common thing. 
most of us, if not all of us here, have overeaten or we, we feel like we've overeaten in our lifetime. That's not what we're talking. We're talking about a loss of control over your eating. Um, and it's in a discrete period of time. Um, and so in addition to that, when individuals engage in that binge eating, they want to compensate. And it's a short term, it's a couple. They really want to compensate so they don't gain weight. So they do what we call weight compensatory behaviors. And that's what you're familiar with, like vomiting, laxative use, excessive exercise, right? And so, and it's really to compensate for the binge eating effort. Um, that's an important distinction, at least it's not us, if the tech people can't figure it out, right? <laughs> um, um, binge eating disorder is different in that you have the binge eating episodes, um, you don't tend to see the weight compensatory behaviors. That's not to say that they don't engage in like yo-yo dieting over the course of their lifetime, it's, it's not, but that, that correspondence, that direct correspondence between the binge eating episode and the weight is absent. Um, in addition uh, to unique to binge eating is the, the characteristics of the eating episodes are really filled with a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, depressive symptoms. And so um, in addition to that, uh, um, they, they will actually eat when they, they'll engage in binge eating episodes, even if they're not hungry. Um, and so, so they have different characteristics than bulimia nervosa. The frequency of binge eating for both, uh, the frequency of binge eating compensatory behaviors for BN is at least one time per week for three months. Um, so about four times a month for three months. For binge eating episodes, the same thing. It's one times a week for three months, okay? All right, in the United States, about one in five women struggle with an eating disorders, and these are estimates, but only about 30% seek treatment in part not only because it's, um, there may be, it's hard to access treatment, it's also not affordable. Um, for middle income families, um, the cost of treatment is really expensive. Among ethnic minority women, we um, definitely research in the past three decades have demonstrated that eating disorders, both at clinical and subclinical levels are present. Where, where we see a disagreement or, um, it, or a mixed literature are in the prevalence rates. In the ED field, historically, this, is a, this has been developed as a white upper middle class disorder. That's, there was, um, you know, for the longest time, there was a stereotype that they were the only ones that experienced this sort of disorder. So when we talk about diagnostic criteria, the medical model, our assessments, it's all built on that information. So, so unfortunately, when we talk about eating disorders, the white group is the reference group. Okay. So compared to white individuals um, with bulimia and um, binge eating disorder, um, some research shows that ethnic minorities have equal rates to them. Some show they have less and some show they have more. Definitely in a, in a um, global um, assessment, the World Health Organization said that consistently across countries, one to five percent of the, of the population of women um, demonstrate binge eating disorder, one to two percent bulimia nervosa, with slight deviations based on the country, but that's consistently the rates. Um, anorexia nervosa is different in that we do see high rates of anorexia nervosa in white women compared to other ethnic minority groups in white westernized women compared to non-westernized um, women as well. The only difference is with the Asian groups, that literature is mixed as well. Some studies find equal, some studies find um, Asian women to have more, some find them to have less. Yes? So I noticed that you refer a lot of these statistics to women. Does this also apply to men? So the today's will be focused on women. So we have an increasing rate in men, but the, but the rates are not the same. Yeah, um, the other thing is that, so what happens with men is the same thing that happens with ethnic minority women, right? Um, in that this is built around women. What we know most about it is around women. Um, it, it took quite a bit to actually just get the DSM-5 to eliminate amenorrhea as a criteria because it eliminated men, you know, like that where there's, it's problematic when you have symptoms that only one group can, um, one biological sex can, can apply, you know, can meet. 
Um, and so, and that's the reason why it was eliminated. Um, definitely among men, um, what I can say, sexual minorities do have an increased risk. Um, those that um, subscribe to more of the uh, female um, ideals um, show higher risk within, the, within that group than others. Um, but men are also contextually different because there is also a drive for muscularity. So there is a thinness couched within a drive for muscularity. So often when you see models for men, it, 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 it will include additional things. But it's still a work in progress. It's still a work. Okay. Good question. Okay, so um, the trans diagnostic model for eating disorders is really Fairburn's model. It's a cognitive behavioral model. And a trans diagnostic model is really looking at what are the features that are core to all eating disorders. No matter if you're AN, BN, or BED, what are some of the core features? And so it's, it's developed as a house of cards, except it's in reverse order. The core feature according to the cognitive behavioral model, um, so kind of the lower depth, is this over-evaluation of weight and shape and their control. They're like, that's part, that, 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 um, that's the underlying mechanism behind all eating disorders. When present, it increases the risk of the development of an eating disorder in an individual. Um, it, also, when, it also maintains the disorder. So all treatments have to target over-evaluation of weight and shape, if they're ever, if they're ever going to really make a difference in the symptoms, but also in preventing relapse. They also say that over-evaluation of weight and shape and eating then leads to dieting and other weight control behaviors. Um, and, so, and so that's kind of the middle depth. Dieting and other weight control behaviors, that's where they um, include like um, setting rules about food. And with eating disorders, um, it's, it's rigid rules about food. Food. Um, they may uh, do fasting, 24-hour fasting, so those sorts of, of um, behaviors. Um, that dieting and weight control behavior then leads to two, two separate pathways. So binge eating, and binge eating then leads to compensatory behaviors like vomiting, laxative, and excessive exercise, or the AN spectrum, which is a loss of weight that then leads to a starvation syndrome. A starvation syndrome, if you've never heard that, really means that once you, once you get to a low body weight, you're actually cognitively impaired. Your decision making is impaired, right? And so for a clinician, that's really important information because our treatments, cognitive therapy has to change depending on the cognitive impairment that you're dealing with with an individual. Um, and in, in extreme ca uh, cases that we see in inpatient units, you know, um, we've had BMIs of 10, 11, and 12, where we actually do start to see um, brain damage occur um, with those really low individuals. So that's, that's, where, um, that's where that comes from or what that's referring to. So it's built on like a house of cards and it's directional. It's built on this medical model, right? Which is, this is the core underlying mechanism that we as a, a medical model have to target or treat. Well, and one of the things that, um, that, as I mentioned earlier, is that transdiagnostic model has not been evaluated among ethnic minority groups or ethnic minority women. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Well, so one, there isn't any research, and we seek for our models that they're universal, right? That they apply because they're important. They guide research and decision making, and they guide treatment development, right? They also guide what we target and how much we focus on those things in treatment. Does that, does that make sense? So they're really important for our field. The other reason why it's important to look at these models um, across different groups is we do have evidence that ethnic minorities present differently than, um, than the white reference groups. Um, so for example, in Latinas, binge eating is more likely to occur with the family than not. So where eating disorders in, among um, the white reference group, we actually see binge eating occur in isolation, alone, um, and there's a secrecy about it. Quite the opposite with, um, with Latina families, it actually occurs in family meals, um, which is really different. Um, like we mentioned earlier, um, the um, 
black and the Hispanic groups are less likely to, to demonstrate an intense fear of fat. They don't present with it. In fact, um, I work with um, treatment providers in Mexico, and one of the things they say about our treatments is, I just never open the body image module. It doesn't apply. They don't subscribe to the thin ideal. Um, it's not relevant. And I think that, that connects to both of these. They don't, if you don't subscribe to a thin ideal, you're not gonna show an intense fear of fat, right? But in all of this, right, fear of fat has been defined by the dominant group. It's possible they do show a fear of fat that we're not assessing that is qualitatively different, right? So in all of this, keep in mind, right, that how we ask the questions is really important. Okay, so in this study, what we did is we did a network approach. A network approach to psychopathology is different from a medical model. In the network theory of psychopathology, what it actually says is people have symptoms and it's a network, just like a friendship network. And those symptoms interact with each other and influence each other. They also are not equally weighted. So if you think about the diagnostic criteria, right, it's you have a symptom or not, and, uh, and the presence of those symptoms are all equally weighted. Right? In the network, it says that they're actually unequally weighted, that they're gonna, you're gonna have some symptoms that are core and some that are not, and that the relationship between those symptoms is actually what develops the mental disorder, and it's also what maintains the mental disorder. Um, it parallels, even though the uh, transdiagnostic model was developed for, um, based on the medical model, it does parallel the, um, the transdiagnostic model, right, in that deck of cards. Those cards are all connected in a very specific hypo hypothesized way. Um, so the, uh, the goal of the network analysis and network theory is really, it has three goals. One is, hey, let's identify the, the relationships between symptoms when people present. Let's try to understand which symptoms are most important. And the third goal is to use this to guide decision making. The cool and exciting thing about network analysis, and it's really just come up as, um, as potentially a fad in the, in the last five to 10 years, is that it's, an, it's a, a technology or an approach that can really merge the research practice gap. So in looking at the research we're doing, we're, t we're connecting it to populations. We need big sample sizes. But a clinician can do this with a client. You can assess a client with the same measure we're using here and, 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 do, and the software to do the network analysis is free. Now the downside is you have to know how to do the network analysis, right? But your, but your generation is the one that's learning it um, in, their, in their training or has the opportunity to learn in their graduate training. So here's a tool that researchers can use and then clinicians can use as well. Is that, so that's, that's the uh, potentially exciting. So in network analysis, there are a few studies that have been done uh, predominantly with white individuals. In these studies, they just basically have used who they've got. Their, um, you know, over 90% of the, each of the studies of the samples are white with just like, you know, the, the typical like 1% black, half a percent Native American, American Indian, those sorts. Um, what they have found is um, that in um, studies where they just look at anorexia, the core symptoms, those symptoms that really emerge as central is desiring weight loss, dietary restraint, preoccupation with weight and shape, shape over evaluation, and fear of weight gain. So really consistent with, with the model, with the transdiagnostic model. With bulimia and the, and the ED, and some studies combine them, some have looked at them separately, they find very similar, desiring weight loss, preoccupation with shape and weight, weight and weight over evaluation. Each study beyond those, each study may have an additional, you know, that comes and goes, but those are the consistent ones. So our goal for this study was to examine if the tri trans diagnostic model would extend to a group of racial and ethnic minority women. We wanted to examine, do the do, does the network replicate? Um, and then we, uh, we hypothesized that given, I mean, it's limited research, right? So it's really exploratory. 
but you need hypotheses, right? And so we're like, well, we think it's going to work out. We think we're going to get shape and weight over evaluation. We don't have sufficient data to suggest that it won't work out, right? Um, but we also acknowledge that it was really exploratory. Okay. Um, so, and again, and I know I talk fast, so if you need me to slow down, <laughs> let me know. Like, if I'm throwing too much at you. All right. So, the sample was 920 ethnic minority women, adult women, um, women that identified with one, um, with more than one of the groups that we're focusing on, we excluded. Um, we asked women so they could, um, participants could um, identify or check all that apply. Um, and then we, we just chose those that, um, that say, no, I predominantly identify as an Asian woman, as a black woman, Hispanic woman. They're all in the United States. And we got to, um, even after excluding those that identified with more than one group, there was 261 Asian women, 296 black women, and 246 Hispanic women. So I'll give you a little bit about the demographics of the age. We did stratify by, but we tried to stress, stratify as best as possible by age and also by income. And so what you'll see is about 19% of the sample is in the young adult range, 30% are 26 to 35 years old, um, about 25% are 36 to 45. But the majority, almost, you know, around 80% of the sample is 18 to 55 years old. In terms of income, um, and so we, we asked them income um, for yearly income. We got about 28% uh, percent between zero to 25,000 yearly income. And then, um, and you can see the distribution down there. We really struggled to actually get enough participants in these higher income brackets. Um, they're just less likely to do surveys, I, we think, or they're, they're harder for us to reach. So education, um, about 27% um, said that they had a high school diploma or GED or equivalent. Um, about four to four and a half percent were in a trade tech vocational school. 19% um, said that they had taken a couple of college courses but never got actual college degree of any sort. 12% um, associate degree, 22 um, bachelor's degree, 9% a master's, and then about 4.8% had MD, JD, PhD, or equivalent. Okay, recruitment. So recruitment for um, this population, so ASU has a contract with Qualtrics, and so we use the Qualtrics research team. Um, in the Qualtrics research team, they take your survey and they actually will connect it to all of their partners. Um, you tell them the parameters that you're looking for, so for us it had to be ethnic minority, women, and then we also had a screener that they had to pass through that I'll get to in just a sec. In addition to the Qualtrics research panel, what we also did is we did targeted social media recruitment. And in that, what we do is we'll go to some of the major cities and we'll look for social organizations specific to that ethnic group. Um, and then we contacted that organization and we sent them our electronic advertisement related to that. Um, and so that was our strategy. We estimate about a reach of 10,000 people. And that's rough <laughs> estimate, right, because it's you look at the organization, you see how many people they have, and that's um, and that was the reach um, for our sample of 920. Okay. Um, I mentioned we did a little screener. We were looking for women who who um, who had some disordered eating, um, and so our, for our screening, so they got um, they got a consent form that disclosed that they were going to be screened, and that you know, they, they may not meet criteria for the full study. Um, and then they got our screener. And the screener was in the last month, have you had um, any one of the following? So any binge eating with loss of control, and it's defined for them. So three times or more, three times or more vomiting, three times or more lax abuse, and 13 times or more of excessive or compulsive exercise. Um, and if you're wondering why these, so um, the diagnostic criteria for um, binge eating or weight compensatory behaviors is at least once per week, right, for a three-month period. So you would expect you'd need at least once per week in a one-month period 
for them to, to now they, they could, um, they didn't have to meet all of them, just one would screen them in. Does that make sense? The excessive compulsive exercise is 13 times or more because that's actually more normative. So in order, because it's more normative, then we have a higher threshold for it to be diagnostic. And, it's, and it, even like in college populations, excessive exercise is actually pretty common. So even in college populations, we, we change the criteria. So, um, so here I'm just gonna try to paint a picture about the severity of the women. So, um, you know, definitely, a, as a clinician researcher, you don't want PIVA to be severe, but given that they are, we were really excited um, because they are actually pretty clinically severe. And, and there is no, there, this is really rare in research studies to actually see this level of sever severity with ethnic minority women. Um, and so, um, so let's take binge eating with loss of control. Um, you know, so about 20, 20, almost 25% of the sample said that they had, they had engaged in that behavior one to four times in the last month. But 22% of the sample said that they had engaged in that behavior between five to 22 times in the past month. And we had 13%, 116 women actually said they, they were actually engaging in binge eating almost, if not every day in the past month. We did do a one-way ANOVA to compare mean differences to see if we had any ethnic group differences, and we didn't. Um, there weren't um, any mean differences in terms of the severity of the number of days that they were engaging in binge eating and loss of control. Similar story with vomiting. So you, vomiting as a use of um, controlling weight or shape. Um, and so 25% hadn't engaged in any in the past month. Um, we had 14% that endorsed that they had done it at least three times in the past month. And then we had 18% that had four, four to 15 times per month. And then we had 387 women who actually said they had done it 16 times or more in the past month. And we questioned the data, to be honest. I was like, there's no way, right? Because it, this is a low base rate symptom among white women, right? Um, and so we, uh, we also allowed them throughout the study to like write in text box and stuff like that. Um, and we got responses. So in looking at like their tech, they gave us their algorithm, their math. Like, well, I know, you know, and so some, and sometimes they actually end up like Monday, Tuesday, and so you saw, and it, so, it, so that shit just, they were trying, it wasn't this random responding that we were getting, um, but they were, they were trying. Again, no differences between the groups. Here's another example, laxative misuse. This one was actually higher rates, which is opposite to what we see with white women. Um, you tend to see higher rates of vomiting compared to laxative use. Here we actually saw in our sample that there was more laxative misuse, um, and misuse meaning not prescribed by a medical provider, um, you know, um, in this, and again, no differences between the racial and ethnic groups. So we were, um, so this was a very clinically severe sample. So if they screened in, they got an online questionnaire that lasted about 20 minutes. The order of the presentation of items was randomized to, um, to really protect against any fatigue effects. Or, um, that might occur. We also embedded within the survey validity items to detect random responding or inconsistent responding or lack of engagement in the survey. And so validity items throughout the survey, um, some of them were age. So what is your age? And they had to input that in like a text box, right? And so anybody that gave us a discrepant answer, um, you know, in those three prompts across the survey were dropped. Um, another item said, what, um, tell us um, the last number of your cell phone. So the last digit of your cell phone, and it was a drop-down menu, right? Again, that number, and we said personal cell phone. That number should not change, right? Um, and then the, the other items were a bit more, um, they're a bit more fun. So one of the questions was, have you ever had a heart attack and died while watching TV? Mm -hmm. 
It's a yes, no answer. Anybody who answers yes to that has stopped paying attention to the survey, right? <laughs> um, and so we also embedded stuff like that and, so, um, and dropped individuals. So the sample sizes I gave you were complete sample sizes. Um, in addition, what Qualtrics did for us is they have what's called fingerprint um, uh, online technology to, uh, um, to identify or block people from, from participating more than once. Um, and so, um, and so, yes, yeah, so to, to make sure we didn't have multiple respondents. Everybody was compensated $5 in cash or gifts. They had options. So with the Qualtrics Research Panel, they can work towards um, something. So like we, um, in investigating them and trying to decide if to use them or not, like you can, uh, what caught my attention, is like you can work, you can do surveys to earn money towards a pair of Louis Vuitton shoes. Or like stuff like that, you know, it's creative, it, it seems to work, right? But the, so the participants had that option. Okay, so the items I'm going to be showing here is the eating disorder examination questionnaire. The, um, so the EDEQ, the eating disorder examination is our diagnostic interview for eating disorders and it's a structured interview. These, this questionnaire was developed out of that. The, e, the examination is based on the DSM-5 criteria. So the items in this questionnaire correspond to the criteria in the DSM-5. Um, this questionnaire you can use, there are algorithms to actually get diagnostic, um, you know, uh, rates of diagnosis for anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. Um, and so it's also consistent with the transdiagnostic theory. So Fairburn, who developed the transdiagnostic theory, is also the same person that developed the EDEQ. In, there's 28 items, and it assesses weight concerns, shape concerns, dietary restraint, um, and also the frequency of the most common types of um, weight compensatory behaviors. This measure has been used across um, both culture, race, and ethnicity. Um, and so there is psychometric um, data supporting it. Um, okay, so we used our packages to do our network analyses. We, did, we used BootNet for any network estimates and centrality differences and stability, and we used QGraph for strengths and centrality. And then we also did a network comparison test package. We definitely made sure the data met all parameters or requirements for a network analysis. And we also looked at strength stability to make sure we didn't have, uh, um, uh, that we had sufficient stability and not error in the network to, um, that would really um, render our um, interpretations questionable. And so we did our strength stability estimates as well before doing any analysis. How many of you have seen a network analysis? Okay, all right. Well, they're cool graphs. Um, okay. So one of the first things we look at is, all right, what are the central symptoms? And the way <laughs> centrality and strength works is that if you think about, if you think about a friendship ne network, there's usually one person in a clique who is really the connector of everybody, who's really like the, the one that keeps everybody, you know, like glued together. That person would be the person in that network with the most strength the most centrality, right? They're, mo they're the most influential and all the lines connect to them, right? Um, and so, so that's what this is showing us. What are the symptoms that are most connected and most core to the psychopathology in this group? Okay, among Asian women, vomiting was the most central symptom, followed by a strong desire to lose weight, a fear of weight gain and weight dissatisfaction. And so typically in the literature, anything above one is really what is discussed in terms of strength or core psychopathology. But equally important is what's not relevant. What's not relevant to the psychopathology? Excessive exercising is not relevant. Um, setting limits on your food intake isn't relevant to Asian women in terms of eating disorder psychopathology. Secretive eating is not relevant. And interestingly, for my clinician hat, weighing. So in our, in our units in eating disorders, uh, predominant all white women, they really have an issue with weighing and being weighed. 
but in um and and it comes out as an issue you know like as part of the network for what not here not for them so that was interesting among black women we see slightly different but also some similarities vomiting comes out again right it's the second one weight influencing the judgment of self so how they um, evaluate themselves their weight influences that um, and also um, trying to follow some rigid rules related to eating those were the three that emerged um, things that didn't emerge weighing again no issues with weighing and the question is really like how how much would it bother you if I were to ask you to weigh yourself every day over the next week others seeing them eat not an issue, not relevant to their psychopathology, and having a flat stomach, also not relevant to their core psychopathology, or it's less influential compared to others. Hispanic women. So we had five symptoms really emerge as core to psychopathology. Vomiting, again, core psychopathology, a strong desire to lose weight, eating in secret, fear of weight gain. Um, and seeing one's body in the mirror or naked really um, was re related to their core psychology. Um, others seeing them eat, not an issue. And, and that's not surprising, right, but in terms of hearing that most of their binge eating does occur in a family setting, right? Um, eating large amounts of food, not distressing. And that's not binge eating, but eating just a subjective, like I ate too much, right? Not distressing to them. Flat stomach, not, not, sorry, not just, I don't want to say not distressing, not part of their core psychopathology. And then um, fasting um, also wasn't relevant to their core psychopathology. So the other nice thing about a network is it gives you a network visualization. And so um, these are all the symptoms on the EDQ. These are all the items. So every circle is an item on the EDQ. Now you can see how it might be relevant for a clinician with one. And clinicians love graphs. They would love this, right? Um, and the fact that you get multiple colors. I don't think you can see them, <laughs> but, um, but they, no, they totally would. So, in these visualizations, it's set that correlations that are not significant or less than a 30 do not emerge. Okay? So these are all significant correlations and a strength of 30 or greater, and that's consistent with the literature. And so in a network, so each item is a circle, and then the, um, the, how thick the item is is how strong the correlation is. Does that make sense? So the thicker the line, the stronger the relationship between these two items. The thinner the line, the weaker the relationship. But it also clusters symptoms together. So look what we see here. So if you think back to the, to the transdiagnostic model, what do we see clustered together? Binge eating, loss of control over eating, right? Guilt related to eating. Um, we see the dietary restraint, rules about eating clustering together. We see weight and shape that cluster together. Binge eating and loss of control aren't actually related. They're still alive. Mm -hmm. um, so what we see here is we do see large amount of food and loss of control, and that's related to feeling guilty. It's related to excessive exercise and vomiting and laxative use. Does that make sense? But binging is not related to vomiting or laxative use. Right? Really interesting. Really interesting and also important because the theory would state that if I target this, it will diminish this. Right? But think about it from a clinician standpoint, and I'm jumping ahead from in terms of like the discussion, right? If I'm using the transdiagnostic model as it's developed and I'm a clinician, if I target this, I'm going to expect this to be Right? I may think that I'm experiencing treatment failure if I don't see that decrease when I expect it to. Does that make, do you see why now, like the, the clinical implications of doing this work? Okay. So, oh, so here's, so here's the Asian women. And so we do see like the shape overweight evaluation cluster together. 
we do see secrecy with binging, clustering together, and we see this like fear of gaining weight, fear of fat, um, and that's related to setting limits about food, to excluding certain foods, to having rigid rules related to fruits, right? And how this connects to like the other dietary stuff is through wanting a flat stomach. Okay, for black women, we again see this connection of loss of control over eating with um, large amount of food vomiting. We do have now a line between binge eating and loss of control, but they don't cluster together. Um, again, we do see guilt now directly related and strongly related to loss of control. But again, this cluster, so uh, what this would tell me is if I'm treating a patient, if I target any one of these, and given the strength of it, I would probably choose these two to target, right? Um, that I should see this cluster diminish and weaken. Okay, and then Hispanic women, we see yet a different clustering. Um, and so here we see loss of control. Again, large amount of food, vomiting, guiltiness. Um, but now we actually have different, like, different ways that they're clustering together, right? The, the picture looks different. The red lines are negative correlations. I don't know, if, I don't think you can see them, but there are a couple of red lines and those are negative correlations. They are significant, they're just negative. Okay, we did look at a network comparison test and that means, okay, and that means really to see, um, do, do the, um, does the strength of the connections vary across the groups? And they don't, they're actually pretty equally similar. So in terms of how strong is this network for representing this group, that strength is really similar and isn't different. And we also looked at the edges. So, um, and the edges mean the lines. So are we seeing any consistent patterns of differences in the lines across the three groups? And that was not significant as well. So in terms of across the th three groups, there's consistency that we are seeing. Okay, so now let me kind of summarize what we found and benchmark it with what the literature has found. So these first three columns is our study, and then this is what the literature has found when looking at, um, when looking at white women with mixed ED samples, because our sample is definitely mixed, we didn't subtype it. Um, and, so, and so these are the differences, and I think they're both similarities and differences. What we do see consistently in the white women is that there is a core shape and, and weight um, uh, uh, over evaluation that comes out consistently. Um, and so it's a strong desire to lose weight shape and weight preoccupation, fear of weight gain, right? Um, and so sometimes it might be a different item, but consistent, you see the majority of the items that are central, that core yeah, um, shape and weight. Then you also get dietary restraint that emerges as central um, to it, and then um, and feelings of fat that emerge as central to the psychopathology. Um, the compensatory behaviors don't show up in the network for white women. In fact, they're the end, right? So you'll have binge eating, and it relates to laxative use, vomiting, and those don't actually, they, it's like they end the network. Does that make sense? They're not like central to the network. Um, whereas with the ethnic women, the vomiting actually was related to a lot of stuff. It was in a cluster, right? And it, it did emerge as central to it. So that's one of the main biggest difference. We do see though, fear of weight gain, right? Strong desire to lose weight. So we do see some weight and shape evaluation, but potentially it may not be as strong. You don't see that, uh, that strong, potentially. The important thing to know about that, those studies that we just kind of summarized is it included an adolescent sample, it included two adult samples, and then a study that had a mixed adult and adolescent sample. And so those were the, the, the factors that they, um, they consistently found across those studies that emerged. So in general, here we go back to the transdiagnostic model. And you know I, the verdict is still out. I do think it needs some editing potentially, 
um, to be relevant to ethnic minorities, but not as much. Definitely this, right, was central. So that, that deck of cards model um, doesn't, may not apply as well um, to ethnic minority women, right? This relationship here is not, is not um, the same way, or the pattern did not emerge the same way as the original model. Um, but there are similarities. In every single ethnic group, there was some overvaluation of weight and shape that emerged. There was some. Um, and then vomiting consistently emerged as a central symptom in all three groups. So they're important to go over some limit limitations. The cool thing is this is the first study to look at a, such a severe clinical sample, such a large sample size. The downside is we got to take everything with a grain of salt because we need to replicate it, right? We might be an anomaly. It may be that our sample is just not representative of the population in the United States. We really don't know that. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, one of the nice things about this study is we use the EDQ. All the studies that I've cited have used the EDQ. So there is a consistency in the measures that we're using that allow for comparison across studies. That's great. Downside, it's a self-report questionnaire. In the end, we really don't know how many people are over-reporting, under-reporting, right? I mean, the, the constraints of a self-report questionnaire um, apply to this study. The other nice strength of this study is that we do have consistency in analyses. So for every, all the studies that have been reported, they actually um, publish in supplemental information their scripts for using R. Um, and we'll, when we go to submit for publication, we'll do the same. So not only is there consistency in the, in the software that's being used and the analyses, but in the scripts we're using too. Um, it also allows people, the reviewers, to actually identify if we've made an error by, by publishing our scripts. Um, the key thing about doing this work is in the end, we actually don't know what we don't know, right? We don't know if there are symptoms that are unique to ethnic minorities that we've never asked, right? Because we've always used uh, this model, which, ha which um, historically does not represent them. The other thing is this is a cross-sectional study, so they're correlational. The, the items and the analyses are all correlational, and we didn't do a diagnostic interview. A diagnostic interview would have definitely probably lowered some, for some people the rates of the things that they were reporting because we were really subjective to, you know, they think it's a binge, right? Um, and there may be some systematic differences in people who are more likely to say, yes, I'm binging versus those that are like, no, this is not a binge. And maybe it is, right? Um, so that standardization. But there are some, some cool potential clinical applications, right? So this identifies symptoms that play a large role in the psychopathology, potential targets to treatment. Um, and the, among, white, um, among white women, there's definitely research to show that, what, we get, that the, what emerges from the network analyses and from the medical models um, also applies in the, in the real world. You can target shape and weight over evaluation, right? And it does change weight dieting and weight compensatory behavior the next week, right? So there's research to show that that definitely supports these findings, right? We need similar research with ethnic minorities given the network analysis findings, right? Um, the other thing that we really need to, to make people aware is that symptom reduction will not, may not occur in the way that we expect it to, right? And, we and I covered some of that already, like it, it, binge eating and loss of control aren't clustered together. Um, and so in, they, may, they may still reduce, but it may not be in the way I expect it to. And that's, not, and that's consistent with, there is one or two studies, small samples, of um, Latina women in an eating disorder treatment where the clinicians have noted that they, sh they don't show symptom reduction at the times that you expect. So like at a six week assessment, after the sixth session, you would expect a certain number of reduction in certain based on what you're targeting in treatment. They'll show it at 12 weeks. So there's a delay, right? And now we, 
now we may have some ideas to why potential, potentially, right? If the replication comes out, then potentially we might. So I think the future research um, is, is we need to replicate, right? Um, we need to include culture specific variables. Truth be told, we had some measures in here to look at a culture of stress and discrimination. Um, and, uh, but we had too much missing data and their um, and reliability issues and the factors didn't map out. So we had to throw those out. Um, and then um, that longitudinal allow analyses would actually allow us to do some causality, right? Inferences that we can't do here. And then, uh, and then the, the, the something we're gonna start to do is actually we're gonna take a couple of individuals who are in treatment and we're gonna do, give them the EDQ after each session, can we actually, what happens to the network throughout a standard treatment protocol, right? So that's what we do. So nothing occurs without a team. Victoria Perko is our network analysis guru or expert. And, um, <laughs> and then, um, and here's the individuals that help us with um, design, idea development, and all aspects of, of the project. Thank you. I know some of you need to leave for, for another talk. Um, but for the rest who can stay, do you have any questions? I might be misremembering this wrong, and I don't remember what group you said, but you said how uh, they choose not to look at images of Big Ben. Um, and um, I was just wondering, so maybe that means like they don't compare bodies as much. And so I was just. It's wondering. not that they don't choose to look at images, it's they don't internalize. Okay. So it's not their ideal. Okay. So what do you think then is there, like, have you seen the literature or have you, like, seen with your research? Is there, like, a common reasoning behind that fear of losing weight or that, like, wanting to thin? Is there a thing? Because I feel like for white women, maybe, and I don't want to like, right. but it's saying like, I compare my body, and so I want to be thin. I want to, so I was just wondering if there's any common. Yeah, women who internalize a thin ideal truly believe that they will be more successful, more happy, yes. and get, you know, the American dream, you know, um, type life if they get to a certain weight, right? And, um, and definitely in treatment, you know, it's really sad because they get, they usually get to some sort of weight and they're still not happy. Yeah. And then it's like, oh my gosh, you know, like, right. Um, and so what happens that there, it's, there's different pathways, but not all, not even in the white women, there are multiple reasons for engagement. Emotion regulation is one. Um, physiological regulation can be another. Right, and so um, so there are multiple pathways to engaging in any specific behavior, okay. you know, um, and, and even for those that subscribe to an ideal, they, it may be all of the above as well. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. You briefly touched on um, that treatment is not normally affordable. Yeah. Um, are there... Can you speak to any sort of programs that are trying to make it more accessible to different populations, or is that just something that needs to be created? <laughs> right, I, no, it needs to be worked on. Yeah. It needs to be seriously worked on. Um, you know, so um, the, these can be really pernicious disorders, mm -hmm. and an in, inpatient stay, or even a residential facility, can, can really $80,000 more. Right, outpatient is 150 in our community an hour, right? And um, if you think about, you know, a year to two years of treatment, right? It adds up, it really adds up. Um, we did have a sliding scale fee clinic for, in our community for ED treatment, but it's hard for them to maintain, to make, to make a profit, to make a living, mm -hmm. right? Um, because you, you still, the regular provider may, may um, schedule 12 patients to see eight. On occasion, those 12 do show up. So you're still there for the, you know, for that the amount of time, right? And you look great. But now if you have a sliding scale fee, right, you have to see more. Does that, do you see the dynamics? Yeah. Right? Exactly. And so, and unfortunately, health insurance doesn't cover or it only covers in a certain severity spectrum. So, so there are groups that really lobby, like National Eating Disorders Association really work, is trying to work hard to get more mental um, insurance coverage for individuals with eating disorders. Um, and less dictation by insurance about what 
So, um, so sometimes you'll have union students say, okay, um, we're going to provide eight sessions um, only in patient, and then they pull, right? And so this person may have been doing really well, they lost insurance, they lost, now they can't, right? And so then there's all those dynamics too that really muddy up the treatment. So I think we need a lot more stronger advocacy and more mental health coverage for by insurances, definitely to, um, and also that would drive down costs. Right. Once you have managed health care cuts, it is going to drive down some of the costs because they negotiate and they have a different level of power negotiation than the individual patient does. So, what about? Well, I was just going to say, so I missed, sorry, I missed the beginning of that question, but related to that, I'm wondering if there's differential access to care for, for this biracial ethnic minorities. There, there definitely is a, a, a significant health disparity in that there is differential access for sure. Um, and not only just differential access, differential referral when detected, mm -hmm. um, and um, stereotypes, it's documented that there is a stereotype, not only by individuals, but also by providers, um, in attributing eating disorder symptoms to external factors. Like, oh, maybe they're poor, oh, maybe they're food insecure, or, you know, or maybe they're, they're in sports, right, and then less to a potential mental, you know, um, that also then um, gives, you know, makes it a barrier to care. And then, um, and then, um, you know, there's language barriers, access to you know, transportation barriers and those sorts as well that can occur. That's an intersection between both income and ethnicity. Yeah. Um, it's no coincidence, most of our treatment programs have failed. Yeah. Right? Um, and so just even that's a structural barrier for even somebody who can afford. On average for treatment, how like if they were being seen and it was like that 150, how often are they seen for like success? it depends. It depends on the severity. Okay. Um, it you know depends on the coverage. Mm -hmm. Um and just and also um yeah, like that that can vary. You know, and there's some programs that have like intensive outpatient, it just yeah. It, it depends on the program and the severity and yeah, yeah, and what they can afford, both time and finance. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that we are thinking is it's kind of interdisciplinary, so it's not that they have to see for the dietitian, but they have to see a counselor, an MD. So it's yes. kind of like a three appointment. It's so. a multidisciplinary yeah. team. And that's so important because in our multidisciplinary teams, dietitians are also doing treatment. They're doing exposure and cognitive therapy related to the food rules and to the, you know, into the those eating behaviors. So it's not just the clinician who's in, who's doing the treatment, right? Um, they are a key part to to the treatment, the dietary treatment. Yeah, which is why I think this is particularly relevant, right? Because how cool would it be that you could do this too on those things that you're targeting and the yeah. team as well. Right, if everybody's targeting different clusters, right, do we see more? I mean, it's an incredible question, right? Yeah. Do you think you have the power to uh, look at the interaction between income and race and ethnicity? I think I, I think I might. Yeah, in terms of the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to look up to see. Um, maybe if I group well. I think I think I might. Yeah, I have to talk to our statistician and be like, "Hey, do we have power?" To, yeah, I mean, as a secondary data analyst, I mean, you know, that's sort of exploratory. But I think it would be given your comments about sort of explaining away some of these effects. Maybe mm -hmm. it's both and, right? right? So maybe it's raised, you know, these things and the fact that their income is an issue. And right. Yeah, it could be education too. Yeah, right. So There's so things. many ways. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's a good suggestion, especially, I mean, because um, some of those comparisons are just, um, you know, chi-square tests or ba basic Bayesian. So if it's exploratory, if we present it that way, um, yeah, we might be able to. And then yeah. it would actually hold power to some of these, you know, as a advocacy yeah. point to um, public policy and coverage for care. Yeah. Based on income. Yeah. 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 The other cool thing, um, yeah, I don't know. We did get some insurance information because some states have state-based insurance, right? And so New York and California do. And 
I don't know if we have geographical because we wanted the data to be identified. That's so cool. I know, but we may have insurance information. I don't know. Um, yeah, and that might that might also be another. Yeah. Cool. Other questions from the group. Well, thank you so much. Thank this you.